get started. I got some new toys to play with up here. This is good. Anybody want any hydrogen? Nasty stuff. All right, so um, moving along, I'm going to finish up carbohydrates today and start talking about glycolysis, which is the process whereby we break down glucose. So very important process. Last time I uh, finished with reduced sugars, and I will remind you that reduced sugars are those that have had their either ketone or aldehyde group reduced to an alcohol, and we call them um, sugar alcohols in general. That's uh, the general name that we give to them. Aldotols means it comes from an aldose. Uh, ketols we come from a ketose. A ke I guess we don't say ketotols, but in any event, uh, when we reduce either of those groups, we create an, alco an alcohol instead of an aldehyde or a ketone. And the advantage of those um, reduced sugars is that they are fairly unreactive, and they're not metabolized like sugar is. So we don't really realize the energy out of them that we otherwise would if they were, uh, in fact, sugars. Well, there's other modifications that happen to sugars, uh, one of which you see right here and one of which uh, you will see actually later uh, today, and that's the phosphorylation of glucose. Okay, So glucose um, gets a phosphate attached to it in a reaction that occurs inside of glycolysis. And in that reaction inside of glycolysis, we have a creation of something called glucose 6-phosphate. And uh, as you might imagine, putting a phosphate onto glucose changes its chemical nature a little bit, uh, partly because uh, of the fact that this now is charged, and this was not charged that we started with over here. Okay, And that actually gives glucose 6-phosphate a little bit higher energy. So glucose 6-phosphate has a higher energy associated with it than does glucose itself. And that's part of the reason why we have to use ATP energy to put that phosphate on. So it takes a high energy molecule to be able to transfer that phosphate onto glucose. And I'll talk more about that when I talk about glycolysis. A related compound, actually, and this doesn't look very related, but, we can, but uh, ascorbic acid can actually be synthesized from um, glucose. This is a process that can occur in uh, either a laboratory where we're chemically synthesizing it or in other animals. We can't synthesize this ourselves. One of the reasons we have to have vitamin C in our diet uh, is that. But vitamin C is ultimately or can ultimately be derived from glucose as well. I mentioned briefly yesterday glycosides, and I'll say a couple more things about them today. Uh, I will remind you that we, when I talked about glycosides yesterday, I pointed out that whenever we uh, tie up the anomeric carbon of a sugar with something, yesterday you saw it being linked to, a, uh, to another sugar, whenever we tie up that anomeric carbon with something, we um, create a glycoside. Well, in this case, the something that's attached is actually a methyl group. And you might say, well, where's the anomeric carbon? How can I tell which is the anomeric carbon? The anomeric carbon will always be the carbon that is linked to that oxygen, as you see here. So that carbon right there. In the case of an aldose, that'll always be carbon number one. In the case of a ketose, that will always be carbon number two. Okay? So that's um, how, uh, in this case, we're making a glycoside. So this guy's a glycoside because now this uh, uh, hydroxide on the anomeric carbon has somehow been altered and uh, created this compound. Uh, can you repeat the part about the aldose is what? Aldose is what? The one, two, three. One, two. Oh, so the, 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 the point was how can you tell where the anomeric carbon is? And the anomeric carbon in a ring structure is always the carbon that's attached to the oxygen of the ring. So in the case of an of an aldose, that will always be carbon number one, as you see here. In the case of a ketose, that will always be carbon number two. Okay? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's talk about disaccharides. So disaccharides, as their name implies, um, are molecules that contain two sugar units within them. And so disaccharides, the most common disaccharide that you'll be familiar with is uh, sucrose. That's table sugar. And uh, this is not table sugar, but table sugar consists of a
bond between fructose and glucose. Uh, in the case of sucrose, as I will show you in a minute, it's actually a, a um, diglycoside, meaning that both of the glycosidic, I'm sorry, both of the anomeric carbons are tied up in this glycosidic bond. This um, is a glycoside, but you'll notice this glycoside only has one of the, uh, of the anomeric carbons tied up. It's actually this one right here. This is an alpha-1-4 linkage. How can I tell that? Well, there's alpha, meaning this bond is going down. That's carbon number one. So alpha-1. This is carbon number four. Count them. One, two, three, four. So I've got an alpha-1-4 glycosidic bond, as you can see here. And this is linking two sugars together. By virtue of the fact that I've taken up one of the anomeric carbons, I've created a glycoside. It only takes one anomeric carbon to be tied up to make a glycoside. Now, that's what a, a glycoside looks like for um, a single glycosidic bond. If I go back to show you sucrose, Sucrose, this high-quality artistic thing, was actually rendered by me, I'll have you know, okay? Uh, and that's what it looks like. So on the bottom, we have fructose. This is what fructose looks like. And you'll see that fructose has, as I said, carbon number two attached to the oxygen. So there's carbon number one, carbon number two attached to the oxygen. That's the glycosidic carbon, uh, the anomeric carbon. I keep saying glycosidic, the anomeric carbon. Carbon number three, four, five, and six. So I said it was a diglycoside because both of the anomeric carbons are tied up in a single bond here, okay? There's the anomeric carbon of glucose, which is shown on top, and there's the anomeric carbon of fructose, which is shown on the bottom, okay? So both of the anomeric carbons are tied up in glycosidic bonds, and as I said, I refer to it as a diglycoside uh, for that reason. It is a disaccharide because it has two sugar units. Okay. Uh, as I said, that's table sugar. Um, oh, I didn't want to do that. Okay, sorry. All right. So um, another common disaccharide that we encounter is lactose. I've mentioned lactose before. We talked about it with respect to E. coli. And lactose, as I mentioned, is called milk sugar because it's the most common sugar found in milk. It is a disaccharide between galactose and glucose, okay? So what we have here is um, looking at this, we have the galactose on the left side, we have the glucose on the right side. I'm not going to make you memorize the structure of that, so don't worry about that. But the point is that these are all different um, uh, structures related to disaccharides. I don't like this one at all. In fact, that's why I drew my own structure, because to do this, you'll notice they've got to contort these bonds and they actually have to, f the real structure is actually flipped underneath it like I showed you. So the way they've drawn this, that's actually carbon number two right there. And it's sort of a backwards way of drawing it. So I don't like drawing it the way they've drawn it. Not, you're, you're not responsible for drawing it, but if you get confused looking at their structure versus my structure, that's the reason uh, that that's the case. Other common uh, disaccharides that we see are maltose. Uh, maltose arises from the breakdown of larger carbohydrates, uh, like amylose, for example, gets broken down into two unit pieces uh, called maltose. And if we do a similar thing with cellulose, we create something called cellobiose. And I'll say something about cellulose in just a little bit. So that's some common disaccharides. Now, uh, talking about sugars, it would be uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say a little bit about artificial sweeteners um, because artificial sweeteners are um, important molecules and they're molecules of a fair amount of concern. And so I uh, will tell you just a little bit about them today and hopefully uh, balance, I think, both the concern and the, um, the, the legitimate um, concerns we have about these molecules. So artificial sweeteners are used in a lot of products that we eat. And the reason that they're used is because artificial sweeteners don't contain hardly any calories. They produce very, very few calories, but they produce sweet taste, okay? So having a sweet taste and few calories is nice. Um, sucrose or glucose uh, has a sweet taste, but it also has a heck of a lot of calories associated with that. So um, it's important when we think about the price we pay for enjoying sweet tastes, okay? The price is either we have 
calories and blood glucose issues, or we take something that we might have, say, some concerns about. Well, one of the c compounds that some people have concerns about is what you see on the screen. It's called sucralose. It is, a, it is an artificial sweetener. And sucralose uh, advertises itself as, well, it's good for you because it's made from sugar. Okay? Well, I could think of a lot of toxic compounds that I could make from sugar. And just because I made them from sugar it wouldn't necessarily mean they were good for you. Now, I won't tell you that sucralose is bad for you. I don't know that sucralose is bad for you. Okay? Yeah? Uh, no, this is not aspartame. The, the common name for, for this guy is um, uh, Splenda. Yeah. Okay, aspartame is a, is a dipeptide. Okay, so um, I, I can't tell you this is bad for you. I can tell you the story. If, you've, if you listened to the radio show the other night, you would have heard the story, and I'll briefly tell it to you, that when they were making this compound, they were not trying to make an artificial sweetener. They were trying to make an insecticide. Okay? Because it's known that certain things that if you uh, interfere with processes like the breakdown of glucose or the breakdown of uh, those things in the citric acid cycle, that you can actually kill an organism if you do that. So they were thinking, well, maybe if we can find some way to muck with glycolysis, we will find something that's going to uh, hopefully preferentially kill insects. That was what they were trying to do. So the story goes that the professor uh, in England who's making this compound with his students works late one night and finally finishes the synthesis of what we now know as um, sucralose up here and leaves the powdered residue okay, uh, on a little napkin or something on the graduate student's desk and goes home and forgets that he hadn't, he hadn't told the student what to do. So he calls up and leaves a message for the student and he says, test it. Okay? So the student misunderstands the message and thinks he says, taste it. And so, yeah, okay, true story. Well, I, I don't know it's a true story, but it's, it's a cool story anyway. So, uh, I, the, the, Anyway, the student goes and he grabs the stuff and he tastes it. So the professor comes in Monday and says, well, how did it do? And he said, it tastes great. And he says, what the hell do you mean it tastes great? <laughs> and he said, you said to taste it. He said, I said to test it, you idiot. Well, fortunately, it didn't turn out to be very good at being an insecticide. Uh, and it did taste sweet, which is what he reported. And that, so a lot of things uh, followed from that. Um, I worry about this one a bit because we don't see anywhere in nature, we don't see carbon chloride, chlorine bonds. The places where we see carbon chlorine bonds are things like dioxin. Okay? And just because it has a carbon chlorine bond doesn't make it dioxin, it doesn't mean that it's that. Okay? Um, but I do worry about the nature of that bond and how the body handles that. Will this compound be stored? I don't know. Um, has it been studied? Yes. Okay. So it's clearly not a major carcinogen. It's clearly not something that causes immediate problems and so forth. But like anything else that I'm eating, I'm kind of wondering over a long period of time what's going to happen with it. If you're looking for artificial sweeteners or you're looking for my recommendation for artificial sweeteners, um, my own uh, uh, personal uh, thought on this is that uh, NutraSweet, which is the um, dipeptide between aspartic acid and um, uh, phenylalanine, is probably about as safe as you're going to find probably about as safe as you're going to find. There are some concerns with it as well. And one of the concerns is that people who eat or drink too much of it, it's like anything else. Okay? So moderation is probably good. If you're having a, a Diet Coke a day, probably you're OK. If you're, eating, if you're drinking three liters of Diet Coke a day, you might want to just cut back just the tiniest bit, uh, because that could um, pose problems. Now, diet um, uh, artificial sweeteners have a, a downside, some of the concerns being health concerns. But they actually do have a good side as well. For people who are monitoring their uh, carbs, and it's very important, I think, for all of us to monitor our carbs, um, this can be a, a good way of avoiding a lot of carbs in your diet. Okay? Um, as we will see, one of the real problems happens when we get high blood glucose. Um, glucose, as I probably have told you, and I will tell you many times the rest of the term, is a poison. And your body treats it like it's a poison because it acts like a poison. Um, and it's for this reason that we're, we want to be very careful about how much our, our blood glucose levels go up. Our body makes insulin to reduce blood glucose levels because insulin favors our cells taking up glucose. And you're saying, well, if it's a poison, why is it taking it up? When the cells take up glucose, they either burn it or they convert it into glycogen, neither of which act like a poison. 
the glucose itself will act like a poison. So we want to be careful with how much glucose we're getting. We know that it acts like a poison because if we look at the detrimental effects that people have from diabetes, for example, we know that there can be very severe problems. You can go blind from diabetes. You can lose your kidneys from diabetes. You can, a lot of people who've had diabetes for a long time end up having uh, portions of their lower anatomy amputated. And um, these are all nasty things. And it's arising from the fact that people with diabetes have their blood glucose levels out of control. They get too high and cause problems. So there's a yin and a yang associated with artificial sweeteners. Questions or comments about that? You had a question back over here? Yeah. If, I, I can't hear you. What do I think would happen if sucralose was building up in my body over years? I, I wouldn't want to speculate, but I also wouldn't want to have it building up in my body over years. <laughs> I don't know, you know. Um, uh, to be honest with you and to be fair, I think to sucralose, it probably would not have much of a place to accumulate. When we see things like, for example, I mentioned dioxin. It's probably not a fair comparison. Dioxin, actually, if your body gets exposed to it, will store it, and it'll store it in fat tissue. But the reason it will do that is because dioxin itself is very nonpolar, and it's very soluble inside of fat. This guy here isn't going to be very soluble inside of fat, so it's probably less of a concern for that in that respect. But um, I just don't like that carbon chloride bond. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's see here. Um, Turn from disaccharides to polysaccharides. So as the name suggests, polysaccharides are uh, molecules that have many uh, sugar units uh, connected to each other. And polysaccharides, a uh, real good example you see on the screen there is called amylose. Amylose is a polymer purely of glucose. Everything in it is a glucose. It may have thousands of these units. Amylose is found not in us, but it's found in plants, where plants use it as a means of storing glucose. Amylose um, is very simple. It has all of the units joined together in what are called alpha-1,4 linkages, just like you saw before. But now, instead of having one alpha-4 linkage, we may have hundreds or thousands of these linked together in a long, long chain. Okay? When we talk about starch, starch is a uh, name for a couple, or actually a mixture, of polysaccharides that are found in plants. Starch consists uh, of two polysaccharides, one being amylose that you see here, and another one that is related but not exactly the same called amylopectin, A-M-Y-L-O-P-E-C-T-I-N. Amylopectin is another one. Okay. Now, um, amylopectin is related to a uh, polysaccharide we have, in, we have in our cells called glycogen, so I'll talk about the two and tell you the slight differences between them. Glycogen is the um, primary glucose storage form in animals. Okay? So animals store their, their glucose as glycogen, and again, they may have hundreds or thousands of residues present. The structure, however, is a little bit more complicated than that of amylose. So when we look at amylose, amylose has that repeating unit alpha-1,4, alpha-1,4, alpha-1,4 may have thousands of these end-to-end. Uh, -end. Well, glycogen also has um, thousands of glucoses linked in an alpha-1,4 linkage. So that's what you see around here, alpha-1,4, alpha-1,4, alpha-1,4. But about every 10 glucose residues or so, we see an, what's called an alpha-1,6. That's carbon number 6 right there. So what these are is a long straight chain, and the straight chain has branches. Okay? Now those branches for animals turn out to be pretty important. Okay? The more branched a molecule is, the more ends it has. Okay? So I could take something that might have uh, a glycogen that might have 1,000 glucoses in it, but it might have, let's say, 100 ends. If I have one amylose and it has 1,000 glucoses, it's going to have two ends, right? Well, that turns out to be important because these polysaccharides of glycogen and also amylopectin are broken down starting from the ends. So the more ends you have, the faster you can release glucose. 
And that turns out to be really important for animals because animals have to chase prey, they have to escape predators, they have to be able to move quickly, and they need very quick sources of energy. Well, glycogen provides that important source of energy. We store glycogen in our liver and in our muscles primarily. That's the two most common places that we find them. And I mentioned that glycogen is related to amylopectin. And amylopectin also has alpha-1,6 branches. But instead of having them every 10 or so uh, glucoses, they have them about every 30 to 50. Amylopectin is not nearly as branched. And again, this sort of makes sense because if we think about it, plants don't need those immediate sources of energy. They don't go running away from things. They might like to, but they don't get a chance to run away from things. So their energy needs are not as rapidly changing as those of animals. Okay, yeah. What's the difference in the The difference in the plants with respect to what? Uh, energy needs? Okay. So why do plants even have amylopectin? Is that, that part of the question? Yes. Yeah. So um, that when you start making branches, you do provide more uh, capacity for storage, it turns out. Okay? So these branched molecules are kind of feathery. And in a feathery sense, they absorb and hold water uh, very well, which may be a, a factor for plants uh, to some extent why they have any, any amylopectin at all. I'm sorry? Um, yeah, yeah, I think that would be safe to say, yeah. Yeah. I'm, not a, I'm not a botanist, so probably I'm the wrong person to ask, but I would say, yeah, root vegetables would tend to have more starch. Yeah. Uh, the last uh, of the polysaccharides that are purely glucose that I want to mention uh, is that of cellulose. Cellulose is a um, polysaccharide. It's, it's found in plants and in fungi. And plants, and I believe fungi as well, use it as a structural component. They don't use it for energy. Okay? Well, what is it about cellulose that's different from, let's say, amylose? Okay? They both have 1,4 linkages. In the case of amylose, the linkage is alpha 1,4. In the case of cellulose, the linkage is beta 1,4. Now, that very slight difference has a very big impact. Okay? We, being um, human beings, cannot break down cellulose. We don't have any enzyme that will do it. So when we eat plant material and we think of it as roughage, that roughage is because we're not digesting the cellulose that's there. Plants use it for their cell walls and structural integrity. We can't go out and eat grass and expect we're going to get much energy out of it, right? We can digest amylose because that's an alpha-1,4 linkage, and our enzymes will break that down very nicely. So we know we can get energy from starch. Go eat a potato. You get plenty of energy from that starch, right? Well, some animals, of course, can break down cellulose, and they themselves can't break it down directly, but they break it down because they have in their gut, in some fashion, a bacterium that contains an enzyme known as cellulase, C-E-L-L-U-L-A-S-E. -L -L -E. Cellulase is an enzyme that breaks down cellulose. That means, therefore, it breaks beta-1,4 bonds, and the beauty of this for animals like ruminants, like cows, okay, is that they can get energy from eating grass, which is why you see them out grazing and eating grass. They're getting energy from those glucoses that are in those celluloses that, that are contained in the plant tissue. Okay? And the most common question is, well, what, can we get that bacterium in us? And the answer is no. Uh, the structure of the cow's rumen is uh, such that it facilitates the growth of this bacterium. We don't have that ability. And the next question I get is, well, if we took the gene for that and we put it in us, could we do that? And the answer is, I suppose you probably could, but I think people probably have enough problems with indigestion that I'm not sure they'd want to go eat their lawn as a way of getting energy. So, so maybe not a good idea. I don't know. Okay. Starch is a mixture of amylose and amylopectin, as you can see there, as I mentioned before. There's amylose. There's amylopectin with a branch. This also points out something here I should show you. Uh, 
There's that 1 6 branch. You notice that only these two are involved in the 1 6 because all these out here are 1 4 again. So the 1 6 branches are pretty rare. Most of the chains are in the 1 4 configuration. OK. And this uh, shows us a little bit about how the more branching that we have, the featherier it is. This is glycogen compared to, say, amylopectin. And um, no major point there, but just uh, give you a visual uh, interpretation of the difference in those structures. OK. Um, let's see. I want to just very briefly mention a couple of things. One is there are some other modifications to sugars that happen. One is making what are called amine sugars. And like we have amino acids, amine sugars are something that have amine groups in them. Here's N-acetylglucosamine, as we can see here. That means it's basically glucose, okay, with where carbon number, well, carbon number two, the hydroxyl, has been replaced by this N-acetyl group, okay. Here's N-acetylmuramic acid. I won't really say much more about that. I'll show you a structure that involves that in just a second. Um, this guy right here is um, important because it is, in polymeric form, it is the uh, structure that gives rise to chitin, the exoskeleton of insects. So chitin is a polymer of uh, N-acetylglucosamine. Now, one of the reasons that I show you, or there's chitin right here. So we can see N-acetylglucosamine. We can see the linkages. You don't have to worry about the linkages there or anything. OK. One of the reasons I showed you the muramic acid is that when we look at bacteria, bacteria have cell walls that are um, important for protecting the bacterium uh, against uh, insult and so forth out in the environment. And these guys are laid down um, as one of the structural components of them, what are called peptidoglycan layers. Okay? So peptidoglycan layers uh, simply means that it's got some peptides meaning short uh, protein chains, that are linked to these polysaccharides. So here's N-acetylglucosamine. Here's N-acetylmuramic acid that you just saw. And we can see how these guys form a sort of a network. And it's a structural network that holds um, these guys together. Now, one of the things that when we think about, for example, drugs like penicillin, one of the things that penicillin does is it inhibits the ability of bacteria to make their peptidoglycan layers. That's what penicillin does. And so if the bacterium can't make its peptidoglycan layers, it can't properly form its protective membrane, uh, the protective cell wall around its membrane, and the bacteria uh, ultimately die from that. OK. I'm throwing a lot of names at you. So I had peptidoglycan. Now I'm going to call you, show you something called proteoglycan. Okay. These are both polymers. All right. I'm not going to say what's the difference between a peptidoglycan or a proteoglycan from a chemical basis, because I don't think that's really appropriate. But I will tell you something about these, these interesting compounds that you see on the screen. Okay. So a peptidoglycan, okay. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, now I'm using the wrong terms myself. A proteoglycan all right, is, again, a protein linked to, when we say glycan, that means a polymer of some sort. Okay, so a proteoglycan is something that has a protein linked to a long polymer. Well, the polymers that are linked in proteoglycans are interesting compounds. I know they're a little hard to see on that structure on the screen, but I'll describe them to you. They are disaccharides that are repeated hundreds or thousands of times. Okay? So this would be a repeating unit of something called chondroitin sulfate, Here's chondroitin 6 sulfate. Here's dermatin sulfate, blah, blah, blah. This guy right here is pretty important. Heparin is an anticoagulant that's in our body. It is a proteoglycan. Okay. And these guys all have interesting and common properties that they share because of their chemical nature. I'm going to tell you what that is. Okay. Heparin is described as the most negatively, or the highest concentration of negative charge in your body. Okay. And when we look at these guys, we see that here's a COO minus, here's a, another minus here, here's a minus here, here's a minus here. I've got four minus charges on every repeating unit. Now imagine that I have these repeating units stretched out 
over several thousand. Okay? If you think about this, this is what we call polyanionic. An anion is something that's, that's negatively charged. It's polyanionic. Okay? Every one of those negative charges repels every other one of those negative charges. They want to get as far away from each other as they can. And so if I have one chain of this lying down next to another chain, they're going to get as far away as they can. Well, what if they're all held in relatively close proximity because they're attached to a protein? That's the proteo part, right? Well, I've got all these feathery arms that are out here sticking off of this protein, all trying to stay as far away from each other as they can. It's kind of like going to the party and there's that one person you don't want to see, right? And so you're going to stay as far away as you can. Same thing that's happening here. These negatively charged groups are repelling each other. As a consequence, they actually alter the property of the water in which they're dissolved. They alter the property of the water in which they're, they're dissolved. And the most common thing that they do is they make the water very slimy. Your snot is full of this stuff. Okay? Your snot, saliva, and things like that that we think of as very slimy are full of these sorts of compounds. And they have this property that they are altering that nature of water. They're actually making it slimy. And that turns out to be very good in some cases. It's not too much fun when you have a runny nose. But it's really good when you look at the joints of your body because your joints are lubricated using some of these slimy compounds. So the joints of your body work and move smoothly because they have a polymer called hyaluronic acid. It's this guy right here. Hyaluronic acid. H-Y-A-L-U-R-O-N-I-C. Hyaluronic acid changes the character of the water it's dissolved in so that it actually becomes much more like an oil that lubricates than it is like water itself. Well, in my knees, that's really good. When people get old and their levels of hyaluronic acid tend to fall, they start complaining about joint pain. My joints hurt, right? You can go to the doctor and get a shot of hyaluronic acid into your joints. It's very expensive. But if you get that done and you're having problems, you will find, in fact, that the joint will actually feel much better. I haven't had this done personally, but I know people have had that done. Yes, question. Um, so is the hyaluronic acid, is that a peppermint? Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. 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 No. No, these are all individual. So, so heparin is just one of the many classes of molecules. So hyaluronic acid. Heparin, heparin is what I would describe as a proteoglycan. So all of these guys are proteoglycans. Heparin is a proteoglycan. Hyaluronic acid is a proteoglycan, etc. Okay. Now, I'll just briefly tell you that one of the reasons that heparin acts as um, an anticoagulant, at least partly, is because it's so negatively charged, it'll start grabbing positively charged things. And one of the things that's positively charged that's needed to clot blood is calcium. So this guy will probably reduce blood calcium and as a consequence reduce clotting that's happening with that. Was that a question? Yeah, I do have a question just to clarify. So um, making water sticky or slimy or whatever, yep. um, that's a characteristic of all proteoglycans? The proteoglycans in general will do that. That's correct. Yeah. So you can take uh, chondroitin supplements. Just, just, just a second. Say it again. You can take chondroitin supplements. I'm just wondering why they don't. Yeah, uh, his question is that you, can, that you can take chondroitin supplements. Why don't they have hyaluronic acid supplements? Um, I don't know the chondroitin. To be honest with you, I don't know the difference in terms of how they would be metabolized, but it's probably likely due to that. And I also don't know how efficiently a, a chondroitin sulfate uh, a supplement would actually work in terms of getting internalized. I, I can't tell you that. I don't know. Was there a question back here? All the proteoglycans will have negatively charged sugar residues. That's correct. Yeah, I should have said that specifically. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, so I see the bouncing ball here, which reminds me it's time to have a song. So let's have a song to summarize all this, and we shall finish with the carbohydrates. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, as I showed you, it's got two units, and those two units each have two negative charges on them. So put thousands of those together, you got very high density of negative charge. Okay. This should summarize your knowledge of... Oh, did the wrong one. There we go. It's called heart to sucrose. Very easy to sing. Carbohydrates all should sing. Glory to the Hayworth ring. An O'Mary carbons high when they're in a glycoside. Glucopyranose is there in the boat or in the chair. Alpha, beta, D, and L. Diastereomer, hell. Alpha, beta, D, and L. Diastereomer hell. All right. Okay. Let's see. All right, let's turn our attention now to the breakdown of glucose. So we're turning our attention, this is the very first of what you're going to see are a series of metabolic pathways. So when people talk about metabolism, we're getting ready to do it. I hope one of the things that you take away from what I tell you here is it's really hard to try to define the term rapid metabolism. It's bandied around a lot, but it's really hard to get a handle on, well, what does it mean to say something has a rapid metabolism, okay? We're going to study these as individual reactions in a connected pathway. So if I were to define metabolism for you, I would say it's the sum of all of the chemical reactions going on in a cell. Metabolism is the sum of all the chemical reactions or biochemical reactions going on inside of a cell. Now, let's take a look at what I call the big picture. The big picture has little writing. That's kind of the way life is, you know, big pictures, little writing. Sometimes you get the magnifying glass out to see it. The big picture is that glucose is the most abundant sugar on the face of the earth. It's, again, when we talk about currency, it's one of these currencies of cells. Virtually every cell on the face of the earth is going to have a way to metabolize glucose. Okay? The pathway that you see on the screen of going from glucose at the top to pyruvate down below, this pathway is almost universal. Again, essentially every uh, cell on the face of the earth is not only going to break down glucose, they're going to break it down in almost exactly the same way. Okay. Glycolysis, and by the way, glycolysis, the name tells you what it does. Glyco, meaning sugar. Lysis, meaning split apart. Glycolysis, is splitting apart glucose up here, which has six carbons, into two pyruvate molecules down here, each of which have three carbons. So we're splitting it apart. That's what's happening here. We're also doing one oxidation reaction. One. Not, glycolysis is not a big pathway for oxidation. It's one oxidation reaction that's occurring inside of uh, glycolysis. I'll show you that as we get to it. Yeah? The, the part where you split two glucose and get six, something else, can you repeat that? So I have one glucose that has six carbons. Okay. I end up with two pyruvates, each of which have three carbons. Okay? okay? All right. So that's the big picture, right? Now, I'm not going to make you memorize all the structures inside of glycolysis. Ah, you have something to feel good about now, right? Okay. I do think that you should know the names. Okay? And I think you should know the names of the enzymes. Okay? 
Now, one of the ways, and I have, I've had several students come and they're concerned about how they can study for this material. One of the ways I recommend studying for this is getting some flashcards. And just quiz yourself with it, or quiz each other with them, okay? It's just basically, here's reaction one, here's reaction two, here's the enzyme, okay? There's a logical connection to this. The product of one reaction is the reactant for the next reaction, right? So it's pretty straightforward how they go through. If we look at this as a series of steps, I think we can make sense about how this occurs. Well, if we look at the pathway in very broad terms, and by the way, I'm going to come back and talk about this later. So what you see on the bottom is not glycolysis. Glycolysis actually stops right here with pyruvate. Okay? I should also say one other thing about glycolysis, or two things about glycolysis. All right? One is that glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm of our cells. It occurs in the cytoplasm of our cells. And the second thing, I just popped out of my head. What was it? Uh, oh, I know. Okay. So the other thing that I want to say about this is we, we define metabolic pathways. They're human inventions. I just told you glycolysis starts right here and it ends right here. Okay? But in reality, that's just a definition of mine. All these reactions are occurring in the mixture of a cell. Some of these guys could go over to another pathway and do things. So when I say that this is a pathway, and the way that you will start to think about this is you will think, oh, this is some little sequestered thing that's found in the cell where this is all by itself and this is occurring, and that's not the way it happens. These reactions are occurring in the mix of the cell, and some of these molecules can be involved in other pathways as well. So when I say it's a man-made invention, it's a way for us to think about what's happening to this molecule. But I want you to keep in mind that these things are mixed with a whole bunch of other things, thousands of other things inside of our cells. Okay. When you say things, do you mean reactions? Well, reactions involve molecules, and molecules are the things, yes. Okay. Now, this pathway occurs in two major uh, steps. The first step that involves energy input And the second big step that involves energy uh, capture. Energy input and energy capture. Okay. Well, let's look at that first phase uh, right now and go through the reactions that's involved in that. Okay. What's happening here? I'm looking still at big picture. I'm not looking at individual reactions at the moment, but the big picture is Here's my glucose. There's my starting point. Okay. The very first thing I have to do is I have to put a phosphate on the glucose. That's that reaction I told you about earlier. All right. I make something called glucose 6-phosphate. I'll show you the reactions in a second. Don't sweat this too much at the moment. I put a phosphate on it. I have to put a second phosphate on it. Okay. That's what's happening down here. So I start here. I've got a phosphate. I actually change the structure, so this is glucose 6-phosphate. I change it to fructose 6-phosphate. There's fructose. And then I say, okay, now let's put another phosphate on there. How do I get those phosphates on there? Well, I have to use ATP. So this is why I call it the energy investment phase, because these reactions require energy from ATP. Well, this guy right here, okay, I split into two molecules. One's called, well, I'll, I'll show you the reactions in a second, but I split into two three carbon molecules, all right? And at this point, I'm done with the energy investment phase. All right? So that's that very first phase of glycolysis. Let's look at the reactions that I just described to you, and I'll tell you the enzymes and some things about them as we're going through. We've got about five minutes. Okay. First reaction. Reaction number one of glycolysis. Glucose plus ATP is giving us glucose 6-phosphate plus ADP. There's the phosphate. That's position number six. Okay. The enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is called hexokinase. Again, the name is telling you what it does. In fact, in glycolysis, if you know the molecule names, 
you will essentially know the enzyme names because the enzyme names tells you what it's making. Okay? Hexokinase, what does that mean? Hexo meaning six, kinase meaning puts a phosphate onto, right? So this guy is putting a phosphate onto six carbon molecules, and the six carbon molecule it's making is glucose 6 phosphate. Hexokinase. Okay. The second step of glycolysis involves a what's called an isomerization. That is, it is, re it is changing the structure. It's an isomerase. Okay, so look at what's happening here. Here's glucose 6 phosphate, which is a, um, an aldose. This guy is being changed into a ketose by this enzyme called glucose phosphate isomerase. Glucose phosphate isomerase. All right? So we've just gone from glucose 6 phosphate to fructose 6 phosphate. Glucose phosphate, that's what this guy is, all right? Isomerase, meaning it's making an isomer of it, this isomer being fructose 6 phosphate. Okay, the next step in the process involves conversion of fructose 6 phosphate into fructose 1 6 bisphosphate, the bis meaning 2 which means that the fructose 6-phosphate has to gain a phosphate. That second phosphate is coming from ATP. So we're using now a second ATP. We haven't gotten any energy out. So far, we've put two ATPs into making this molecule. It's kind of like priming the pump. We have to get this molecule ready for the reactions that will happen later. The enzyme that catalyzes this, I'm going to come back and say more about later, it's a very interesting enzyme. It's probably the most important enzyme in the entire pathway. It's called phosphofructokinase, and you may call it PFK. By the way, as before, any, any uh, abbreviations that I use, you're welcome to use. So if you'd like, I'll give you some abbreviations I've already uh, gone over. Glucose 6-phosphate, you can call G6P. Fructose 6 phosphate, you can call F6P. And fructose 1 6 bisphosphate, you can call F16 BP. That helps you? Great. Now, we've used a second ATP. We now have a molecule that has six carbons, it has two phosphates, and we're going we're to split it in half. When we do that, we will have finished the first phase. Yes, Juliana. Yeah, so the magnesium, when, when they list things like that, that's something that's an, actually an ion that is needed by the enzyme for the reaction. And there's, there's actually a mechanistic reason for that. I, I won't go through the mechanistic reason. but the, um, In general, whenever you see reactions in the cell that involve phosphate, they will very commonly require magnesium, very, very commonly. Okay. Now, as I said, this enzyme is very interesting and it's very important. When we think about regulation, all right, we have to think about regulation because we don't, want, we don't want these pathways running all the time. Why not? Well, let's think about this. Let's imagine that I'm sitting at home watching my television, which I don't have a television, but let's imagine I was watching my television, which I don't have, and I'm drinking beer and eating pizza, and I'm not doing anything. Are my energy needs very high? Okay. Do I want to be burning up my glucose to make ATP when I'm not going to burn it up? I don't want to do that. It would be like lighting my fireplace in the middle of, winter, in the middle of summer and wasting all the energy with that. So the needs of my body for energy are going to vary as whether I'm exercising or not. So I want to have ways of controlling these pathways. Now, we'll see that controlling these pathways is really interesting and really important because it tells us something very, very important about our physiology. It tells us something very, very important about things like why high fructose corn syrup might be making us fat. And it tells us how our body adapts to the various conditions that it, that it needs. Now, that's a good stopping point for today. I'll come back and say more about the rest of the pathway and physiology tomorrow.
Hi, what's up, Larissa? Um, okay, so when you were talking about immunizations and you said that they'll like work up to ten years. Yep. What is the like, what's so special about ten years? What's going on? Uh, ten years, years, yeah. So the memory of the immune system is about that. And people argue about how long it actually is, but the 10 years is a good estimate. So when you get something like a tetanus shot, for example, your doctor will recommend to you that if you haven't had one in 10 years, you should probably get another one. Yeah. So if you think about it, you've got really an immune cell that's sitting there that has the right antibody to bind to tetanus toxin. Okay? So 